thank you for recording. And uh, John jumped in and said, uh, yep, I've got it. And so, so this is wonderful. This is the kind of, uh, we talk often about COIL and the spirit of COIL is really about creating that community in that culture of research and development and and inquiry and discussion and that's what we're about and so uh, john thank you so much for for stepping up to the plate and taking leadership on this topic so uh, with that i'll stop talking and we'll listen to john so uh john i'm going to turn it over to you i'm going to mute my mic okay thank you so much, larry uh, very nice introduction and I just wanted to say to everyone before we get started here today, um, I, I'm really excited to be able to do this with all of you. The technology that we're using today finally enables us to have conversations across our entire university, regardless of the space we're in and the place we're at. And uh, I think that's pretty exciting because we have a great university. It's quite large. We have so many talented faculty, staff, and students. And to be able to bring people together to have conversations about issues that you know we feel are important, I think that's really important and vital for this institution. So I'm glad to just be a part of this today with you all. Um, I was wondering if we could get started real quick by actually, if you could just use the chat, if you happen to be at a campus or if you're at State College, and just maybe a, a, just a, your title or, or what it is you do. Because I know a few of you, but I certainly don't know all of you. I'd love to get a sense of, of who all is here today. Um, we're going to try and make uh, this and as it. interactive a discussion as possible. Uh, that includes using the mic. But we would ask, if you're going to use the mic, that you could just do actually what I'm going to do right now, which is I'm just going to click on my little raised hand icon there. And if I see that, I will pause. My, I'm not going to do a whole lot, at least I hope I don't do a whole lot of talking today. I really just want to be a facilitator uh, and, and participant of the discussion. But if I see this icon, I will, if I'm talking, you know, I'll shut up and I'll let the person who raised their hand go ahead and, and uh, state their comment. You can also feel free to type in the chat at any point, and obviously we'll all be able to see it. And um, if I miss something, Larry, if there's a good comment and I miss something, please stop me and we will we'll, we'll chat about it. Um, Kyle, likewise, please, if you guys have thoughts, comments, please feel free to stop me. Uh, I'm going to try and just kind of set the stage initially, and then I built in a little activity that can uh, kind of guide our discussion. But other than that, I, I hope it can be kind of a wide open discussion about um, educational technology and some of the change that, that it has wrought in higher education and some of the potential that it, it can bring in the future. And, uh, and we're going to use um, Neil Postman's article kind of as a guide to think about, critically think about the, the, the positives and some of the things that may not be as positive as we th think about those changes. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard the quote, we shape our tools and afterwards our tools shape us. And uh, in the class that I teach, I teach a technology and society class, uh, we, we cover a lot of social networking technologies and Web 2.0 technologies. And it's just so interesting to see how those tools are shaping our students today. We could probably have a discussion just about that, so we don't want to get off topic. But clearly, um, Marshall was on to something when he, he, he made that statement. Clearly, uh, the internet and technology has changed us in a number of ways. So let's real quick kind of get into the meat of this, a conversation about you know, what we will gain or what we could potentially gain by using educational technologies and what we could potentially lose as well. And to set the stage, there's, there's a little video, about two minute clip, and I'm going to go ahead and let Brad start that in just a minute, but if you have have a mic enabled right now, and I'm going to do this too. I'm going to disable my mic just while the video plays so that we don't get any feedback. And I think this kind of is a nice little two-minute summary of what uh, Postman wrote in that little five-page article that you all were able to, to access. Okay, Brad, I'm going to mute myself. Go ahead and start the video. Today, associate, you know, the digital economy and especially the internet with tremendous liberation of individual empowerment, efficacy, and you don't see this quite no, the, no, the no, same I, way. No, I, I, the way I do, I, I mean, I, I've tried to make the point, that not just in this book but in others, that all these technologies, especially significant ones, such as those you mentioned, are a kind of Faustian bargain. They giveth 
and they take it me. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I write as I do because in America, all we're interested in is what it will give. And there isn't too much discussion on what it would take away. I mean, even something like antibiotics. I think if we ask, well, what problem does it solve? That's pretty obvious. And if we said, whose problem is it? Well, it's what most of us need to solve. But then if we ask, well, is there, will it bring on another problem? The answer is yes, it does. Mm -hmm. A weak immune system. And if you just eat with antibiotics without being aware that there will be a problem, another problem that you wouldn't have had, uh, then I think you're headed toward a kind of catastrophe. Right. So I, I think these are, because uh, uh, I have some other questions, I think you have to ask um, what changes will uh, come about because of this technology, economic and, and political, and who will be the winners and who will be the losers? Well, I think we ought to discuss that. But let's take that back, though, and put it right into the living room. Because, I mean, in your seminal work, Amusing Ourselves to Death, I mean, you talk uh, in depth about the, the social repercussions of television. Okay, so I'm going to stop the video right there, and we're going to go right back into the conversation. And just to recap real quick, I'm just going to focus on actually uh, the first two ideas that Postman posits in his five things we need to know about technological change, which basically he, you know, the last two minute video that we just watched did a good job of, of articulating, but let's, let's just kind of summarize that. So in Postman's first idea, he basically suggests that for all technology, there's an advantage to it, uh, but there's also a disadvantage to it. And those disadvantages may or may not exceed the advantage. So he basically argues it's really important to have an understanding of what you're gaining and what you might be losing, what the technology can do, and what potentially the technology could undo. And then the second idea um, is that the advantages and disadvantages uh, are never distributed evenly among the population. And what I think is interesting about how he, he suggests that is that he says some of it obviously benefits a number of people, maybe even the majority of people. Some of it might harm others and some of it may not be impacted in any way, shape, or form because they may not be participants in that in the venue that that technology is used. But what I, what I find really interesting, and this is something that we talk about a lot in my class when we examine technology in society, is when you see a technology, who are the winners? Who, who benefits from that technology? And potentially, who are the losers? Who potentially could lose out? And just a great example that we've seen play out over the last few years, uh, well, actually two great examples. One is the music industry. Clearly, technology changed the music industry. And at least for the last decade, um, Apple benefited greatly from the technology that allowed it to create a system where anybody could download one of their songs right to their product for 99 cents or a buck, whatever. Um, likewise, a good example is uh, with the digitization of the book, and traditional bookstores are now struggling to be able to remain relevant and economically viable, and hence Borders really struggled, and Barnes & Noble at the moment is, is struggling a bit too. So those are real-world examples where we can see technology creating winners and losers. Um, okay, so with that, uh, I want to stop a second and just ask, does anyone have any thoughts, comments, ideas about Postman's first or second idea? Um, and I, and I'll, I'll, I'll shut my mic off a second. And if anybody just wants to type in the chat, feel free to type in the chat. Just out of curiosity, does anyone disagree with Postman's first idea or second idea? Again, the first idea that technology has benefits and costs, and the second idea uh, that technology creates, well, has technology benefits some people and technology may not benefit other people. John, oh, um, and it, Brad, I can't help but go think ahead. of a... Okay, sorry. I can't help but think about a uh, a really um, current situation that we're we're facing. It's it's been in the news 
for the last several days, and that is the uh, situation in Bangladesh. Uh, so bear with me as I walk through this, but um, the Gar factory collapse and, and the lives that were lost there. The um, I was just listening to a story this uh, afternoon about about how that came about, and it turns out that technology has enabled the globalization process to occur, where companies, for example, in the U.S. can identify global workforces that would be less expensive, that obviously benefit the the host country. So the U.S. benefits by these uh, lower prices. And um, however, the the individuals who who actually work in the garment industry do not benefit greatly. They benefit some because they have jobs. Uh, however, there's a, a huge cost in terms of, of um, their safety because we know that the regulations are not quite as rigorous. And so, as you as you were talking, and as Neil Postman was talking, that was the image that came to my mind: is uh, yes, we've. Uh, via the technology, we as consumers have benefited from these products being made in Bangladesh. However, the actual uh, Bangladeshians have not benefited, uh, or or maybe not as much, because their 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 salaries are so incredibly small, and their health and safety risks are often at hand. So it was just an example that came to mind on that trade-off between the uh, advantage and disadvantage. Uh, Larry, I, I agree with you. I think that's a great example. And, and one thing that, that I think is interesting, and Postman does point this out, is that when a technology enables us to do things in a new way, and certainly globalization has been greatly enhanced and to a certain degree probably made possible by technology, um, the repercussions of that, as you point out you know, very well, may not be beneficial for everyone. But it's not that that was intentionally done. I mean, I don't think there was some grand master plan of, ooh, how can we you know, make sure that we take advantage of all these people? I, I don't think it plays out that way. I think it's a corporation saying, hey, how do we reduce costs so that we can have a, you know, a, a cheaper product that could undersell our competition and hence we'll sell more garments or uh, widgets or whatever it is. And, and so they go about having achieving that outcome and, and using the ends to do so and, uh, and unfortunately it, it can have disastrous impact on, on some people especially when those people don't have a voice or don't have a chance to, to, to be able to articulate their, their concerns. Um, I, I noticed that Rose uh, and well, actually I noticed Kyle you mentioned MOOCs and in fact in the, in the exercise we're about to do we're going to look at MOOCs as an example. Um, but Rose already got things started nicely by saying, you know, technology can create and reduce the barriers to access of education. I mean, obviously, because now technology can deliver, the instructor can bring, just like we are right now, bring a group of people together and, through this medium, and now we can have an interaction that we simply couldn't have done without the technology. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and actually, before you answer that, Rose, although you can type it in the chat, feel free to type it in the chat, let's get into our exercise because I think basically we're already starting it anyway. So the exercise, the ideation exercise, was really to take a look at MOOCs. The only reason I chose MOOCs is just because you can't escape it in the last year in terms of the amount of publications, press, and, and just the, the, the chatter that it has generated, not just in higher education, but really in the larger society. Which, um, which is really interesting to me because, I mean, I haven't been in higher education that long. I've only been in it, uh, i got to think about that, less than 20 years, about 17 years. Um, but in that time, I've never seen uh, a technology have such an impact in terms of a dialogue from higher education across all of society. I mean, uh, there are very few people that I think at this point haven't at least heard a news clip about MOOCs. Whether or not it makes any sense to them, that you know, that may not be, but they've at least been exposed to it, and that's that's pretty amazing. Um, so let, let's take a second here, uh, Rose. You got us started listing a benefit of MOOC increased access. I'm wondering, and again, feel free to type in the chat, or if you want to raise your hand and use the mic, do so. What are does anyone else have other ideas of what could be potential benefits or potential advantages of MOOCs? And I'll, I'll type something in the chat myself. I'm 
Okay, I noticed that Terry said cost, and, and, and I'm assuming you mean cost reduction potentially in terms of the scalability of being able to offer a course to, you know, literally 100,000 people and, and do so for far less than you would to be able to get 100,000 people in an actual physical classroom. Um, quality of instructional experience, potentially. Oh, Kyle, a good point. The ability to bring together people from literally around the world, from all kinds of cultures, to participate in a learning experience that, that brings a level of, of uh, multinational um, you know, participation that, again, we really haven't seen before. But, um, but it does seem to be playing out in the MOOCs that they've offered in the last year. There have been you know, people from uh, not a dozens, but lit you know, all kinds of countries um, all over the world. Asia, uh, Europe, Africa. Big data. Oh, yeah, and analytics. Um, that, that's, that could be a huge benefit because uh, we, we now have such a large sample size, we can begin to maybe even get a better understanding of how people learn through the learning analytics that we're seeing. Does anyone else want to use the mic? I don't want to be the only one talking here. So uh, please feel free, uh, Kyle, Larry, feel free to, 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 to um, chat. Let me just jump because Kyle asked a question of Rose that I thought was interesting and I've been thinking quickly about, okay, what are the downsides? I think it's easy right now for us to get excited about the positives and, and see what we're seeing coming in are the positives and those are all terrific. But really, in the, in the case of MOOCs, what are the downsides? Um, I'm just um, kind of challenging myself to think that through a little bit. If, if uh, according to Neil Postman, we should be critical. Uh, the, I have, and then I'll, I'll stop, is um, that one downside is the opportunity cost. And what I mean by that is that if institutions uh, like Penn State are going uh, down the path of creating MOOCs, you have to ask what else aren't they doing, faculty members and so forth. And um, in how, you know, how does that impact the goals and mission of that institution? Uh, or does it change the, does it change the uh, impression of uh, what the institution should be doing? In other words, forces the institution to rethink some of its long-held beliefs about where its benefits are. So I'm, I'm a little torn here on that one, and I'm, I'm kind of curious to others' thoughts on that. Kyle, any, uh, any thoughts on that? Well, on the downsides, I think a lot of the people who have been thinking about it as long as we have would jump right in to say, well, it's a total disruption, potential disruption of what's going on now and a lowering of quality. And people will think that what's happening out there in MOOCs is what online education is. And they'll, they'll form a new low impression of online learning and then they won't necessarily register for online courses or, you know, that, that now all of the freshman, you know, undergraduate big commodity courses are going to be moved out. And what does that do for, so some of the downsides that have been predicted, what does that do for, uh, for example, the ability to fund research? What if everybody really did, all those commodity courses left, and we didn't have, you know, a lot of tuition and very little cost at the low end, what does that mean for some of the other things that higher ed does? So those are some examples that, that come to mind uh, in conversations when, when you talk to people about potential downsides for MOOCs. Yeah, I, I'm also curious too, Kyle. is, is as, as MOOCs evolve, do, I, I think the way in which they're delivered and the level of interactivity that, 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 and how they engage the, the students in their courses will definitely be enhanced and improve, but yet it, it is still, it kind of creates much more of a co commodity view of what an educational process could be. And as you create a commodity, people will see it much more as, as, as just a, you know, a straight cost for a specific product or a specific, you know, a specific thing, like this is what I will learn and this is what I will pay for it. And in, you know, in higher education, I think a lot of us don't like to think of what we, doing, of what we do as a commodity. We like to think of it as a process, the educational process, not the educational product per se. 
And, and so I wonder if MOOCs will begin to shift the perspective of parents and future students to view education more as a commodity and less as a real process, and not just a process, but an environment. Because obviously, like at State College and the various campuses, that's a unique environment that we've created that obviously in a MOOC, it's, it's, you can't simulate that. You're not going to be able to. John, I wonder if it's OK. I'd like Paul on Rose uh, to unmute her mic and share with us that uh, Chronicle article that she mentions today. Uh, Rose, what were the things that the Chronicle uh, identified as downsides? Rose, we're not getting your audio uh, uh, to come through there. Uh, you've got the mic, but uh, let's see here. Okay, so she's pointing. We can all put a link and see it while we're, while. Uh... Oh, okay. Okay. Um, we also have Keith Jervis on the line, and uh, Keith is a is an interesting vantage point. I, I suspect different from many of us in that he watches the accessibility. Maine. And um, Keith, I'm wondering if you're able to unmute your mic and share with us what you mean by your comment, uh, making materials accessible to individuals with disabilities. Can you talk about that for a moment? I don't see Keith don't on the participant list anymore. Oh, okay. Maybe came in and, and, and left out there. Um, I'm, I'm thinking what he may say is in the current model of MOOCs, which is at least in the Coursera model, uh, heavily video-based. Um, that, it, however, there are captioning and such uh, provided for that. Um, I wonder if if Keith would have spoke to something of the sort of the total experience, maybe not as accessible to other individuals with disabilities. I'm not sure. I'm just. Uh, that's why it would have been interesting to hear from him. Oh, okay. Rose said she didn't get to click on the activate. Brad, can you give her back the mic for a moment? Rose, you're live. Okay. There we go. David commented that he could hear me across the room here. The, uh, nothing like two computers in the same space. The uh, well, actually, I read the thing this morning on my phone, and then I saw Chronicle, and I tried to find the the actual link to the Chronicle article. The um, the, the biggest part is that what I thought was most interesting was that California, which is has a contract with Audacity to do developmental education for 160 students this year, it's like 150 or 160 students. And and there's there's always the question of why do they have developmental problems and how is it actually working? And California is actually paying Udacity to do this training. So it's wiping out all the developmental education costs so the developmental educators and such at the, there's uh, two or three state schools. So I found it quite interesting that, that people within California were going after Udacity to to really the, say, hey, big question, probably to stop this because there's many jobs that are being lost because of the developmental education. Great example of something where uh, there is a there's a flip side to it. People may lose their jobs. John, do you see that much in the way of um, you know watching these trends of technology of how things shift uh, job wise impact? Well, well, from, from I think this is this is a good example of how Postman, you know, suggests that yeah, rightly or wrongly that in America we tend to focus on on the, the benefits and not think so much about the costs. And what's interesting is as, you know, we all know that the U.S. and the world itself has had some economic challenges in the last few years. And as states look to to, to balance their budgets and they try and figure out ways that they can uh, cut costs. It's interesting how the technology, like you know, like MOOC technology, can appeal to a legislator or a parent 
or potentially a student to say, hey, this is something we could use so that we don't have to pay so much to, to offer this type of education. My concern is, do they then ask the question, well, what are we losing by deciding that this is the way in which we want to deliver this type of instruction? And, uh, and that's the kind of, kind of conversation that I think we as educators need to be able to articulate to our legislatures, to our, you know, to our prospective families, our, our students and our, and our perspective, their prospective parents. Um, because I think, I mean, if you follow the trends, I, I, I do think we're going to be pressured to try and do more things like this because of the cost factor. And, and that, I think, is unfortunate because we're not doing this for profit. We're not doing this because of the cost. We're doing this because of the purpose, you know, to educate. And so I, I think sometimes uh, that gets confused as people look at, and, and rightly so, higher education is expensive, and they look at ways to try and reduce the cost, but, but that's, that's not the purpose we exist. To, so, yeah, it, it's going to be an interesting, um, interesting discussion and dialogue in the next few years. That's why they call it a disruptive technology, right? Yeah, I think um, so. We look at it; it's a disruptive technology or a transformative technology. Mm. I uh, was reading something today that uh, that our dean actually had written, and he, he was asking for feedback. And he talked about how you know technologies like MOOCs are often sort of seen as a sort of a shiny object, and everybody sort of runs to it uh, because of the newness of it. And I, I was reminded of a John Nesbitt in Megatrends way back in 1988 or something said, you know, technologies move through stages. And the first stage is people use them to do an existing job. And so they get put to use for doing something that's already there. But then a later stage, and he says sometimes it can take a while to get there, a later stage people say, well, wow, what can we do now that we have this new technology that we simply couldn't do before? Mm -hmm. The answer to that question is really important, and, and that's where I see them as transformative and not, I mean, they are disruptive, they're going to change what we're doing. I, I don't, I'm not saying it has to be either, but I see it as very positive because what we're going to figure out, I believe, is that there is stuff that people can learn on their own and with peer support. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get better and better tools to, to structure that peer support and to make that possible. And we're going to be able to take a lot of what now takes six years to complete, and we're going to be able to push a lot of that out so people can do it on their own at no mm -hmm. cost before they get here. And we're going, to, we're going to start thinking about what kinds of things that do require interaction with, a, with a, an instructor type or with someone with, with uh, you know, higher skill levels than you might be. You know, what, a, what fraction of that can be done through a technology like this where we can mm -hmm. see each other and hear each other uh, you know, and, and when do you actually have to be face-to-face? -face? Mm -hmm. And then we're going to be able to uh, sort of restructure the content of everything. Um, and the focus is going to move from uh, mm -hmm. education as a big, long, hairy, you know, process, mm -hmm. a maximum, max, you know, very intrusive process mm -hmm. to a, a process of accumulating uh, credentials in a way that makes sense to, to learners. In one, in one of the articles, I think it was one that uh, Wayne, Wayne Smoot sent out today uh, about re educational research, mm -hmm. one of the quotes was, you have to fish where the fish are. Mm -hmm. And I think in the future, the people aren't going to be interested in these big, long degrees. They're going to be interested in gaining competence, learning what they need to learn for a particular job or what they want to learn for their own interests. And we're going to end up having to fish where the fish are. And this, this fact that they all used to be, the fish all used to be right here in these four-year institutions uh, doesn't mean that's where they're going to be in 10 years. Sorry, it went on too long. No, that's good. Um, and I think that uh, Jackie makes a really good point here as well about the uh, keynote from Sebastian Thrun when he talks about this uh, blending of, uh, you know, from birth to death, death of play, education, and work. And uh, her point is, Jackie's point is, that uh, she hopes to see more overlap of those. And I, you know, because I was just thinking, Kyle, as you were talking, how certain topics, and Kyle, you happen to know this about me, but I like gardening. <laughs> and, um, you know, there are certain topics where I am personally drawn to invest the time and the motivation and the work to learn on my own. 
So I'm, I'm one who wants to blend. I don't see that as work. I see that as play. And how many topics and how many learners are out there, as we have now extended lifespans, uh, who will want to access information and I'll have the motivation to learn about gardening. And sometimes the websites I go to aren't terrific, but, you know, I always glean a little bit of information from them. So uh, I really like uh, Jackie's uh, uh, sharing that, uh, that comment about that, that blending of the three. I think it's really cool. You liked your comment, yeah, too, I, if she... Uh... I was just going to jump in. I, yeah, I, I was just going to say, I, I think what is, well, there's a couple really interesting possibilities is that, that MOOCs now, um, in the wider conversation, especially I think how general faculty now, I mean, I, I, I would be shocked if there's not a faculty member in this country across higher education who hasn't at least heard the term MOOC. So, so now, you know, they, well, what their opinion is, what they've formed, their thoughts, their perspective, whatever, but at least they've heard that terminology. And now you can have a discussion about, well, what does that mean, and what can we do, and what should we do, and what shouldn't we do? And there was one really interesting example at a conference um, that Educause did online about MOOCs, and uh, it gave an example of a university, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure which university it was. I'm going to say Valparaiso, but I could be wrong on that. My memory's a little fuzzy. But Valparaiso, I think it was Valparaiso, partnered with a MOOC offered, and I think it was from MIT, um, to basically use that MOOC as the online textbook for the the face-to-face the, the -face course at Valparaiso. So they used it as their textbook, the lectures, some of the activities, and some of the content of that MOOC real time as the the textbook for this course at another institution. And, um, and you know, that raises all kinds of interesting questions. The first thing that popped in my mind is, didn't the students at Valparaiso have a slight problem with that in the sense that didn't they, I mean, they could have just taken the MOOC itself. They didn't have to take a, a MOOC inside another course. But the instructor said, no, they actually liked it because it provided a good frame of reference. and. And I guess they viewed it as, you know, something more than just their boring standard textbook that they'd have to read, but this was something they could be more engaged with. And, and, and that raises questions like, well, why couldn't more courses work that way? And, and that had never occurred to me. I just, just one of those things that had never occurred to me. And so the, the creativity that MOOCs can spur in terms of what people think they can do or can't do, I think it is a pretty, that's, that's a benefit. And that's going to be very interesting to see, you know, how it evolves. In this conversation around MOOCs, and I, I know uh, I've heard Kyle speak to this point a couple times, so uh, he can jump in. But um, what we're seeing and what we're where we're basing our feedback right now about the quality issue of MOOCs is something I find curious at times. Um, I've had some conversations with people recently who have said, you know, MOOCs just they're just really bad quality. It's a it's a step backward in our instructional design, and it's you know, uh, it's sort of this negative response to the the instructional design model that they use, which which we know is ha has to be uh, you know that that interaction between the faculty and the learner is is going to suffer. We know that. However, you know, I can't help but think of the benefit. The flip side. I said, you know. What if you're a student in, um, in, in Africa or America or wherever, and you simply have access to the kind of, to, to any kind of uh, higher education? So, you know, you see the MOOC then as an opportunity to interact at some level with people. Um, yes, it may not be the, the perfect, perfectly designed environment where you have the personalization in the one-on-one, -on -one, but look at what they're gaining. And we're seeing people grasp onto that and do really, really well. Highly motivated, self-directed, um, because they want it and they need it. And I think that's really uh, uh, an exciting outcome of this uh, environment myself. And I agree with that. I, I, I think an interesting dynamic that MOOCs present, too, is that you know people, at least right now, you, to, you take a MOOC because you're just curious. 
Um, whereas at a traditional university, it's not always easy for a student to just sign up for a course because they're curious, because it may not play into their degree completion. It may, you know, prevent them from taking another course that they would need to take. Uh, they may need a prerequisite, whatever. But, you know, there, there are some barriers that our traditional system has built into it in, unintentionally or intentionally that prevent someone to take, from taking a course just because they're interested. And so when you get a student taking a course because they're interested, that, that really changes the dynamic. Because, I mean, we've all taught courses, or many of us have taught courses where a student comes in and they're taking it not so much because they're interested, but because they have to. Um, or, I mean, this was a really interesting one. We got a new building a few years ago at Berks, and I had a student who I just I always ask students why they're taking my course, and he simply said, I couldn't take any other course in this building. This is the only one I could take, so I decided to try it. And I, I was blown away because he made an, a, a rather, what I would say, significant decision to take a course simply because he wanted to be in a new building. I mean, <laughs> it's like, really? Um, but he ended up liking the course and getting a lot out of it, so I'm glad he ended him. He was glad he took it. But um, but with MOOCs, you know, it just it opens those doors again, provides wide access, and I think that's a good thing. And and certainly, if people are taking it because they're interested, they're going to be much more motivated because they already have that curiosity. Um, all right, so we've had some great chat. And, and by the way, go ahead, go ahead. It reminds me of a point from one of the articles I read this morning that, you know. In one of the reasons University of California or the California legislators are saying that they are, you know, trying to make this happen with MOOCs is because there are waiting lists for 85% of the classes offered by uh, community colleges in California. So they say that the state's providing access, but then 85% of the courses have waiting lists, so you can't get into them. So yeah, there are there are reasons for uh, you know just accessibility of courses just plays a big part. Go ahead, John. Yep. What I was going to say is we're having some great chat uh, or conversations in the chat portion. My plan is to try and synthesize all this by the end of our conversation because the document that you're seeing that I, that I created, I actually created in Google um, presentation. I just converted it. Well, actually, we ended up converting it to a PowerPoint just to display it here. But, um, but it's a living document. It, it can be edited and added to. So I'm going to try and fill in. Um, kind of the highlights of what we're saying in the chat here in that document. And it's uh, open to anyone in the world. I mean, I just made it generally accessible. So you can feel free to, to check it out. I'll send you the link to that if anybody's interested. Um, it was also interesting, and this is just funny with technology. As I was working on the document, um, people were, I got, I think at one point, three people popped in anonymously to just check it out. Um, I, I don't know if they were at Penn State or not. I mean, I, I think one of I think one of them was Brad, so you'll have to tell me if I'm right there, Brad. But but I know two of them weren't Brad. So who were those two people to check out the document? They just maybe did a search on MOOCs or something, and they came across it. And it was funny because as I was working on it, there they are looking at it. And there's actually a little chat function. I, I just you know if I wanted to just chat and say, hey, what what are you interested about this document? I could have suddenly now had a conversation with people real time that you know. I could have never done without that technology. So it was it was kind of funny. Um, all right, so let's let's move on to the second part of Postman's uh, ideas. That, you know, technology creates winners and losers. And I'm curious, what do people think? Who will winners be in the next five to ten years with MOOCs? Who, who do you think, uh, both institutionally and student-wise, who do you think uh, MOOCs will benefit the most? Um, I, I just wrote down as one example lifelong learners. I think MOOCs definitely provide an access to an educational process that lifelong learners may not have had uh, without without this kind of technology. What are what are some other thoughts? Well, I'll be a little. Uh... I seen Eileen put put Coursera. I was just going to say that yeah, I think companies that that become the platforms for these, at least in the near term, um, are going to be definitely winners in terms of you know they're going to they're going to be they're going to have uh, jobs. So definitely, if someone else was going to say something. I'll I'll mute. I was going to say that uh, you know, as the extreme optimist that I am, uh, if you if you play this out. And say now, hundreds of thousands, if not millions. In fact, why wouldn't you say millions? 
since there are millions of people that have already signed up, millions of people around the world improve the quality of their education. I mean, the benefit, the winners are, are <laughs> I'll say this and then take it right back, are, the winners are everyone because you know, there'll be new you know, solutions to problems and so on. And then I'm you know, putting myself back into the context of the article and saying that, hey, even what looks like a win, so suppose we do cure cancer, great. You know, as a result of, you know, who knows what. Well, there's a downside to that, I'm sure. So anyway, uh, I do think that, to me, the appeal of having millions of people get a better education means we all win. And, John, I, I'd like to speak just for a moment to the issue of faculty. That's the faculty development world is kind of where a lot of my, I, I've, I've been working over the last number of years. My, my reason for saying faculty is I, I've seen such, I know Kyle has as well, such a revised or, or enlivened um, consideration of, of what they can possibly do. And it's, it's been just exciting to watch uh, these, these faculty members who previously perhaps had ra rather rigid models you know, go into the classroom, you've got the projection screen, and you know, this is your mode. All of a sudden, they're given this playground of, of technologies and instructional design models, and um, the ones that I've, I, we've seen early on, and, and, and there are about 20 or so who have been involved early on in, in Penn State MOOC, they, they're really charged up about this, and they're thinking about things, instructional kinds of topics in which they've never done before. And, and to me, that cannot help but influence what they do in the classroom. So I think that richness of, of the, uh, the, the painter's palette that they have to draw from is really pretty exciting. I would agree, Oops, muted myself there. I would agree, I think it is also opening up a conversation a more uh, a more broad conversation about just you know technology and how people how faculty are using it in the classroom and 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 again just like with postman it opens up the opportunity for dialogue about you know what people think really does benefit uh, and and what what some of the costs might be and I think that's that's pretty neat I know that my campus you know, at, at Burke um, we're on Friday we're going to have a teaching ex colloquium on trends in higher education and you know looking at how these trends might disrupt education and to me what's really neat is the dialogue that 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 conversation can create and more and more faculty are now willing to enter into that dialogue instead of ignore that dialogue and I think that that gives us an opportunity to really change change things because now they become stakeholders we're all a part of this process you can just ignore it because if you ignore it you might end up becoming, and I'll go to my next slide here, the loser. <laughs> so with that, um, any, any ideas about who might be the losers? And again, we're just kind of focusing on MOOCs here. But, but who might be a loser with MOOCs? And I, I know somebody already said that you know, um, faculty might end up being losers in the sense that you may not need as many teachers as you've had in the past if you create all these, quote, all-star teachers that could then disseminate their um, their 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 courses to you know millions of people. I, I would argue there's an interesting potential here, and, and this is really interesting for our research institution. Is you know at research institutions, um, research is really a high priority because it, a lot of government funding, grant money, a lot of well, not just that, but potential you know development of products and, and new new ideas and new you know, but teaching on 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 a grand scale really hasn't been able to have the same impact. So we could have a great faculty member teaching bio whatever, but in a pre-MOOC world, that faculty member can't impact more than just you know, a couple thousand students over years. Now that great teaching faculty member could potentially impact hundreds of thousands of students in a couple years. And how all of a sudden do people view our university because we have this incredibly talented teaching faculty member who can draw students in. Suddenly the dynamics of value change for teaching in a way in which, uh, you know, just from my perspective, a research institution hasn't really had before. So that, that could be interesting.
Terry in uh, Student Affairs. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on your comment about uh, Student Affairs potentially being a MOOC loser? Um, just explain a little bit about what you mean by that, if you can. And if you can uh, unmic your, your phone, we can hear you, if that would work for you. Terry, I'm just wondering if you've had a chance to try the mic, uh, to try and grab the mic. We'll give you a, a moment more here, and it looks like Brad has enabled the mic, so you should be able to see it just at the top of the screen there. Um, just by clicking on it, you should be able to, uh, to chat. Sorry there, my I had muted my uh, my mic, and so uh, I had um, wasn't able to respond there. Uh, Terry. Um, I'm wondering if he may not have access to a microphone. That's, uh, as Kyle pointed out, that might be a possibility. Um, so it's kind of interesting when you think about this idea of the winners and losers. Where, you know, and this is probably true, John. I'm guessing from your experience, many times when you um, bring up a loser, um, and I know that's a bad sort of not nice terminology, but when you bring up someone who's going to lose. Um, there's sort of, we're usually able to counter that with a positive sort of win spin, if you will. Do you, do you see that as a common, in other words, whenever I hear kind of a negative, I want to come back and say, yes, but, yes, so people who teach in face-to-face -face may lose, but look at the access you're giving people who can't get to the face-to-face. -face. Is that a, a natural outcome of these kind of conversations? Yeah, I, I think it is, and, and actually Post in that article talks about that. He, he states that the winners are always going to try and convince the losers that ultimately they are really winners in the end. In other words, the technology ultimately ends up being more beneficial than, than harmful, which you know, may indeed be the case. Um, so I, I think it's just a natural human tendency, if you will, a trait that when you, when you uh, are happy or you embrace using a new technology that you see the benefit in it, that you're going to try and articulate that and convince others that you know this benefit is is, is worth the cost. Um, it, it, I, one interesting discussion that I always have with students in my class is about Facebook. I, I mean, what what why are they using Facebook, and and do they think the benefit of using Facebook really outweighs the potential costs? And students at first always not, not universally. In fact, in the last year, I've seen it less. It used to be like 99% of the students would all say, of course it's beneficial, that's why I use it. And I'd have like one student who might say, no, it's, it's not worth it. Increasingly, I've had a few more students say, it's not worth it. And, and so we then have a dialogue about why they've made that decision or why the students who, who use it so, so, so religiously do so. And um, it, it's always fascinating to hear how they've thought about it or they really actually haven't given it much thought. They've done it and they just like it and then when they think about it suddenly they might think oh maybe it isn't as good or oh maybe it is actually something I should use so I, I think it is a natural human tendency. Um, any, any other thoughts about or we don't have to just limit it to MOOCs I was just using that as kind of a, a sounding board to kind of have this kind of conversation are there other education technologies that that people are thinking about that um, could create losers that could impact our, our university. Terry had a hand up. Terry first. Can you hear me? Terry. Yes. Can you hear me? Awesome. Finally. <laughs> I'm just trying to get my mic connected so I can 
past 15 minutes. Um, we also talking about student affairs, and this probably goes back to what Keith was mentioning too. Um, you know, a lot of the the, the, the issues I might see with MOOCs is that uh, if, if if we have students here who are taking classes or, or, or um, and they don't have that other piece of the education that comes with learning in the university. So residents life, counseling services, police services, disability services, I mean, it goes on and on and on. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing they learn besides just what's in the class. So I think they, that's, the, that's the problem in my student affairs when they are using out um, on the other thing piece that comes. Thank you, Terry. Terry, I, yeah, thank you very much. And I was just, I, I think, and you bring, point out a great point, is that as the traditional model of classroom support has been constructed, I mean, for the most part, we've constructed that model in a really pre-digital world. I mean, our universities grew up in a world that wasn't digital. The land grant was, our, our university was founded in a pre-digital world, and that structure of support was designed for that world, and now the digital, you know, the digital world, the internet, and the technologies associated with us, that, with it, definitely can change the dynamic and also change the type of support mechanisms we need. We need it might eliminate some completely, and it might create new opportunities, just like it's creating for these companies like Coursera. Um, I, I, I would be shocked if a student who graduated from college, let's say less than 10 years ago, just go back five years, would say that they could have found a job working for a company like Coursera. They wouldn't have, you know, it just wouldn't have envisioned that. And all of a sudden, now here are all these new jobs and, and with new uh, new potential roles and being new potential skill sets. And I think we'll see that across all segments of our economy. You know, uh, Terry's point also reminded me, I guess, a potential a potential loss, but I, I still think of it as the, the gain is greater, but I'll just throw this out. And that has to do with, because I've been thinking a lot about this, right now, MOOCs are designed and delivered as sort of standalone products, if you will, standalone experiences. And uh, what we give up to Neil Pippen's comment. What we give up in that environment is what you gain from coming to an institution for four years, removing yourself largely from the workplace and perhaps from family, and, and, and having an intellectual growth opportunity that many of us have experienced and, and have benefited from. Now, I, I realize, as I say that, I also realize that comes at a great cost and is not available to everybody. So I acknowledge that, but I, there is something, um, it's intangible, but really critical about that, um, that yes, yes, uh, uh, the, uh, the educational community. Um, I think we're just going to be challenged on how do we create that in, in a MOOC type environment where, where there's other kinds of experiences, the interaction with the students in the hall, um, moving on, you know, the, the music festival and, and uh, football games, all of that that helps us grow and learn as individuals, um, I, I think is threatened by the environment that is strictly technological and strictly, um, you know, in the etherware, if you wear. So I, I struggle a little bit with that in my own trying to, to sort these two things out. I think is going to happen as a result of this. This is the side of that downside that you're talking about. So if that doesn't exist in MOOCs, and if there really is, and I believe there is, uh, you know, this uh, liberal arts nation adds up and all these intangibles, you know, roll together to create people who are, you know, we're going to, we're going to get a whole lot better at understanding what we mean by that, about recognizing it when we see it. We're going to reorganize what we do to make sure that that happens. So it's one of those things that if, if there's something really valuable going on there, and lots of people say there is, then we're going to have to we're going to just be challenged to say, okay, so 
let's you know make sure that happens. I, I agree What's with you Kyle now uh, my only concern doing, is we that we before, don't create a, in order to make a that class more system to address the problem in other words we don't say that only people of this economic group from this sector can participate in this type of educational process now that we still value trying to make that accessible to everyone and in, in a commoditization world I think that becomes less likely because I'm just, let's just think of cars you know a person who's going to buy a Mercedes, a Lexus, a BMW probably isn't going to be looking at all at the Yugo or whatever that car way. I mean, you know, maybe, maybe Kia. I mean, they, they, they've limited themselves to a certain product segment, and that's where they're going. They're not considering the other products. And, and so I hope education doesn't become, and, and to some degree it already is a little bit like that, but, but I hope it doesn't become that, you know, Harvard is, is the BMW. And um, and that's only going to be for a certain type of consumer and nobody else. Um, John, I'm wondering, and, and I'm just looking at the time here, if you would, um, in a, in a minute or a minute and a half or so, would you help us? kind of think about how this conversation went today and, and maybe what some of your takeaways were. But I really think the conversation that we started today, and, and I'm sure people have had it throughout this university, whether it's at a water cooler or whether it's in a meeting or whatever, I mean, to me, the, the, the dialogue that we're having today is going to be able to enable us at this university to really begin to understand what we value, what, what, what the benefits of this technology could be, what the potential costs are. And I'm, I'm really optimistic um, in the sense that I hope we can, each one of us, continue this conversation in the other venues that we are exposed to at this university and really try and bring more and more people uh, into the conversation because I, I think it'll be really vital for this university, especially as we get a new president. Uh, we have a new provost coming in as we have new leadership that the faculty and the administration and hopefully students as well will be able to have a dialogue about this and 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 help this university evolve as it has to in a, in a changing uh, environment that technology is clearly you know having a huge impact on and, and driving a great deal of change uh, again I'm going to take the comments from the chat that people have been typing in I think actually I can select all those comments yeah I can't so I'll be able to take the uh, actual transcript, and I'm going to try and just kind of take the highlights and, and summarize that and add that into my Google presentation document that uh, will be available for anyone. And if you want to share that with anybody, you know, not just at this institution, anywhere, please feel free to do so. That's, that's why I chose to use Google Docs to make it open access. So um, with that, I, the, the Larry, uh, Kyle, I know it's three. Do you, do you all want to have any finishing comments? Uh, terrific, Kyle. That's that's right along the theme I was thinking. Um, again, John, thanks for stimulating this. I think what is good about this process and about having these conversations is that we we not all nod our heads like the German shepherds in the back of the the old Chevys, you know, those little puppet dolls. But we we push each other and inquire and and challenge. And and you've done that very nicely for us today, John. Thank you so much for doing that and, and stepping up. Uh, Brad will uh, post for us, John, a link from our COIL website to your document uh, so we can, we can all go in and look at that at, at a later date. Um, so folks, we're going to sign off. Thank you so much. And as Kyle said, we're always interested in new topics. So uh, bring them on. And, uh, and, and we'll see you at the next COIL conversation. <laughs>